Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, a scripture you're familiar with, but I'm going to pick up on the power of godly restoration. And tonight I want to talk about, very quickly, uh, seven ways that God activates restoration in your life. Because restoration means to make new, to recover and make new. To recover and make new. Glory to God. Wouldn't it be awesome to recover Everything that hell has tried to steal from you or maybe because of, of, of decisions you've made and you feel like you've lost something. But uh, God is in the, in the very ministry and the business of restoration. God restores. I don't know about you. I've made some decisions. I, if, I had a, if I had a do-over, I would just do them over. But I found out when I turn them over to the Lord, then God has a way of restoring and causing good to come out of what used to be harm. Uh, the devil can mean it for evil Genesis, in the book of Genesis. The devil can mean something for evil. But oh, hallelujah, God can turn it for good. Amen. He can turn it for good. Romans 8 says that who shall separate you from the love of God? Uh, for years I used to read that and it would say what will separate you? But uh, it, it's a great day in your life when you realize that the what actually has a who behind it. Uh, it's two different uh, things that can happen, of course. Sometimes people can try to move you away from the love of God, the walk of faith, the walk that you have in the Lord. And secondly, uh, sometimes demons are involved with that. Uh, but it's very important that whatever the who is, that you never allow it to keep you from walking in the love of God because ultimately, before it's over with, love will sustain you and will empower you uh, and the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will begin to flow through that love of God. So you keep your heart uh, fresh toward God at all times. It's not just showing love to one another. It's showing the love of God to the one who first loved you. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us and gave himself for us. Uh, it's important to stir your inner man so you stay in love with the one who loves your soul. Amen. You want to stay married forever to the same woman, to the same man? Uh, it starts like this. You have to make a decision that you are going to stay in love with that person regardless of how unlovely life may deal you a hand uh, for a while. But you have to cast down those imaginations and you have to tell yourself, no, I love that person, that's who I'm with. And if two people do that in a house... Uh, in a household, they'll be doing that for a hundred years. Hallelujah. Do I need to preach on that? On how to stay married, you know, more than, you know, 36 months and stuff, you know? Maybe it should be how to stay in love more than 36 months. Uh, and so it's very important, of course, that we walk in love uh, toward one another, that we think about one another, that we recognize that, and that we let it have its place of sacredness. That whole word... It's so out of kelter, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm almost going this direction, but I'm not going to. I'm about to get off of this. But there are a few things in life that are sacred. And men, men and women who have nothing sacred in their life are set up to be moved off center all of their life. Sacred, the sacredness of things are what keep you balanced. So be careful what you focus your affection on and your mind on. For instance, your marriage is sacred. It was ordained by God. Marriage is ordained by God, and you keep it in that place. And when it's sacred, that means nobody gets in that, in that relationship, to divide it, to distort it, to uh, make it impure, uh, to run it down, or uh, including yourself. You guard it. It's sacred. Hallelujah. Your relationship with your children is sacred. Anybody mess with your kids? They're going to have to do it over your dead body. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. I've known some little mamas to become, you know, like Hulk Hogan. 
You, you just mess with her kid for a second and see what happens. It's on. And, uh, and that's the way it should be also, I'd like to say. Praise the Lord. Never give up on your children. Never give up on your, on your children. Today is not forever. Whatever that problem is you're dealing with, stay consistent, stay upright, uh, stay instructional, uh, walk in love. Remember, you know more than they know. You're smarter than them. I know this is a debatable subject all of a sudden. I mean, I just feel like some debates want to come out of this. I'm not really sure. No, it's very sacred. Listen, your personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and the, and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit which you have received, that's very, very sacred to you. Uh, you have to refuse to let anything get you off of, the, uh, off of that place that God has called you. That, it's a place. That's what it's for. The Word of God itself is very sacred. It's God-ordained. It, it has a kingdom impact to it. It has a forever impact to it. And everything I just named does. It's sacred. Your relationship with God, His Word, with the Holy Spirit, praise the Lord, uh, very sacred. Your relationship with your local church is a sacred thing. When you get to heaven, you're going to know two people when you get two kinds of people. You're going to know your family and you're going to know your church family when you get to heaven. Amen. And you're going to spend the rest, however many umpteen jillion eons, learning the name of a lot of other people. And in heaven, you probably have perfect memory. You'll probably never forget anybody's name. <laughs> Unless you wanted to, of course. <laughs> and then you probably could. All right. Praise the Lord. Y'all doing all right? Joel chapter 2, verse 25. God makes a powerful promise, so powerful that on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Paul quotes out of Joel chapter 2. Uh, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, it illuminated his understanding with revelation knowledge to the place he knew Jesus had poured out the Holy Ghost and he said, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And he begins to say several things. This denotes the, the end, uh, the last age, which you and I, of course, from the day of Pentecost on until today right now, we're living in the church age. And uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and the apostle Peter said, this is it. Uh, so it's not like there was a Bible dispensation and now we're living in, in today. No, the church age started that day in the last days. He poured out his spirit and he is still pouring out his spirit today. Come on, y'all with me? And uh, he, he quoted that out of Joel chapter 2. And one of the great promises of Joel 2, uh, in verse 25 it says, I will restore to you, uh, recover and make new. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army of which uh, I sent among you, and you shall eat in plenty. Every time I go uh, to Luby's, that's what I say. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be Ashamed. Come on, clap your hands right there to the Lord. Would you just stir yourself a little bit? God is in the restoration business. Amen. Restoring, reproducing, making new. Everything about his covenant promises, you see that over and over and over, hundreds and hundreds of times in the Word of God. Uh, the next time you ever are tempted to believe that God is mean, bad, hard, or withholding from you to teach you something, just remember that's not his MO. Amen. No, he's the God of recovery and restoration. Very important. To restore, to make complete, to make new, to recover. Listen to this. It can also mean to repair to a place of new. It can mean to take back. It can mean to adjust it can mean to mend. It can mean to frame and build or rebuild. But all of those things are to the point of new. When God restores, he only has one way of doing it, and that's to make it new. When we go to heaven one day, the Bible says it's new every day. 
Heaven is new every day. Can you imagine waking up uh, in heaven and uh, in every day it's new? Every day it's always new. Anyone in here ever gotten a new car? Yeah, how about a new house? You ever gotten a, a new, new dress or a new pair of pants or something? And they were just all of that. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They were, they were awesome. And when you put them on, you look 10 pounds lighter and, and, uh, and you just look better and, and you're kind of imagining yourself, you know, in, in whatever role that you're imagining yourself. And, and it's just all of that. But, you know, a month later when you're putting those clothes on again, they, they've lost some of their luster. Or else maybe we've gained a little bit more chocolate poundage, you know what I mean? And pecan pie. And I don't have many weaknesses, but vanilla ice cream, I tell you what. But please don't pray that I get delivered from that, would you? Just, just leave me alone. I, I'm, I'm comfortable in my misery on that one. But God is the God of renewal. He makes things new. I just want to make sure, that because someone's going to receive this tonight. I'm going to give you seven things. Here they come. Number one, ways that God uh, restores and, and levels of restoration. Sometimes it happens incrementally in your life, but allow God to do his work. Through faith and patience, you inherit these kind of promises. Number one, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says that God gives you an identity and a purpose when you were in his mind and when you were in your mother's womb, you had a plan and a purpose from God for why you came to the planet, uh, to the planet Earth. God brought you here and birthed you for a reason. And when God and hell has worked overtime, let me just say that, to get every man and woman that's ever been born, every descendant of Adam that's ever been born, the devil will work overtime to try to get you off of the godly plan for your life. People will talk, say, they'll say things. You might have grown up uh, in a way that no one ever encouraged you and, and spoke faith and spoke love and spoke the Word of God and helped uh, move you in a, in a godly path and a higher path. And uh, uh, your, I've always said the way you originate has nothing to do with how you ultimately uh, end up. You have a choice and you can choose life. You can make a decision in Jesus' name that you are going to restore, listen, number one, the divine identity and purpose that God had for you when you were born. Come on, get this in your spirit right now. The apostle Paul thought he was supposed to be a politician. He was Saul of Tars, uh, Tarsus. He was a tremendous man. He had, a, he had an amazing memory. He memorized the first five books of the Bible from memory. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Number, Deuteronomy. He knew all of that. The Pentateuch, the, uh, history says. He spoke 33 different languages. And he was on a rocket to become uh, one of the leading men of the Sanhedrin. He was up and coming. He's got it going on. And, but that wasn't God's purpose for his life. But that's the way he had been steered. But when, when he had an encounter with Jesus and, and he was knocked a, a, on the ground when he was on the road, uh, and, and when that light shined upon him, uh, then the Lord began to say to Ananias, uh, I have a plan. He is called. It was a purpose uh, for him. He's gotten off of that, but I want you to go down and lay your hands on him. He's going to get healed of his blindness, and he'll receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He found the divine purpose and reason for why he was born. God will restore to you years that you uh, have lost. Not everyone's called to be a preacher, but everyone is called to be a, a witness for the Lord. Amen. And everyone is called to get born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everyone is called to seek the plan of God for your life. Amen. If God called you to be an electrician, be a godly electrician. Amen. If he called you to be a lawyer, be a godly lawyer. Somebody say amen to that. No, that is possible. I like lawyers when they're on our side. Sure, if God called you to work at the plants, be the very best you can be. It's a blessing that God called you for that. That's not, that's not a downgrade of any kind. What, are, what is it God called you to be? What are you motivated toward? What do you like to do in life in reality? That's, there's a strong, uh, instead of just fish, there's a strong possibility 
that that has a lot to do with what you were born to do. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a zeal that comes in you, especially as you mature as an adult uh, and you begin to mature, you realize there's some things in life you really like to do. And I'm not talking about playing little games. I'm talking about work and achieving and accomplishing and putting your hand to something. There's things you like. Jesus manifested himself uh, seven different ways. And all of them, uh, only one of them was as a, a minister, as a preacher. Jesus had seven different ways he manifested himself. And those seven things are like a framework for all of, of society. Uh, you and I should seek what God has for our life. Uh, Jesus, uh, he manifested himself as a builder, as a carpenter. Can I have a hallelujah? hallelujah. He's called the great shepherd. Amen. Uh, he is called uh, Jehovah Rapha, the great physician. Y'all doing all right now? And you begin to see over and over, of course, he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the God of supply. He's always been that. So maybe you're called into banking and into money management. I don't know. What is it God's called you into? Uh, it, it's not hard. He is the author and the finisher of our salvation. He is the Word made flesh. He was a writer. I don't think he ever made a mistake. He probably never missed dotting an I or crossing a T. What do y'all think, huh? No, he learned and he grew in seven different ways and God used him, of course, and manifested him in those ways. So the, the reason I'm saying that is every person has a divine purpose. Maybe it's more than one. But whatever, whatever that purpose is, that plan is, pray, seek God, listen, and ask God to restore in you if it's necessary Maybe you've already prayed this and you found your target and you're obeying God and serving God and you're seeing the blessing of the Lord in that. If not, ask God where your place is. Come on, look at two people and say, I'm glad I came to church tonight. Come on. Here's the second thing in restoration. It is very important. 2 Samuel chapter 9. There was a guy named Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, of course, uh, uh, was killed in battle and, and he ultimately he died and, and uh, uh, up comes David, and he becomes the king. And under the normal history, of course, and the normal culture of that day, if, a, if an heir, especially a male heir, was left to the throne, uh, and another person outside of that lineage, that bloodline, came into power, uh, then historically they would kill those, uh, the men especially, out of the, the previous administration. They would kill them. Uh, but David, of course, did not do that. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And when David became that, he, he had a powerful covenant bond with Jonathan. And one day he was having, he was at his, uh, his height as a leader and a ruler, and he's praying and he's talking to God and he's, he's saying something like, I just wish that there was someone left out of Saul and Jonathan's lineage, uh, Jonathan being Saul's son, I just wish there was someone left that I could be a blessing to. How many of you just want to be a blessing to somebody, huh? Amen. And he's praying that way. And someone heard him and said, hey, king, there's a guy named Mephibosheth. He's living over in Lodibar. And he actually is the son of Jonathan. And when, he, uh, when the overthrow took place and when you came to power, uh, he actually fell and, uh, or was dropped by his nurse. He was just a little, a little infant. And it crippled him. It must have broke his ankles or his feet or something. And because of that, he cannot walk. And he, he's living in a place called Lodibar, which means barren and desolate. He's living way below his covenant rights. He's actually the son of a king. And in, in, in just by bloodline, he's in, he's in line to be the heir. But God had another plan, and he put David there. Y'all doing okay? But David had the right heart. I've always said if God puts you in a place of leadership, it's not to make you all of that in a bag of chips and stuff. No, it's so you can be a servant leader. Yes. And you can want someone else to be blessed along with that authority you have in that office of being. That's why husbands ought to be that way. You, you shouldn't dominate your home. You should lead your home. My God, why am I keep getting over on that family thing for a while? It ought to be a blessing in your family. Praise the Lord. Come on, somebody shout, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And so Mephibosheth was there. Here's the second thing. Write it down. 
God will restore your inheritance. Woo! God will, he'll restore your inheritance. Someone said to David, hey, living over in Lodibar is this guy named Mephibosheth. He, he's crippled in his feet. And David said, I won't even rest until you bring him to me. And they went and got him, and I'm sure all of his sons, and I'm sure his servants and all of them, and I'm probably uh, Joab and the rest of them, they're probably thinking David's going to kill him nine different ways. But when they bring him in, he just falls on the floor. And he starts saying to David things like, uh, I'm not even worthy, I'm just a dog, I'm not worthy to be here, don't kill me, take care, you know, don't, don't let that happen. And David said, wait, 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 stop, stop, don't do that. You're Jonathan's son, and I had, a, I had a covenant with him. And part of that covenant was to take care of his family. And if, and if I would have died and I had kids, he would have taken care of my family. And so David tells him about that. They had a godly relationship. Uh, how many of you know it's good to have a brother or a sister in Christ that, who's real? Amen. And just because circumstances change, their love and their commitments don't change. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Disappointments come and go. But covenants ought to be covenants. Amen. And he stood on that covenant. He said, no, I want to be a blessing to you. From now on, you were Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. From now on, you're going to eat like a king's son at my table with my own sons. And he put him there in that position, gave him his inheritance back. I wish somebody would get kind of excited about this. This guy thought, you know, he was dead meat and he's been hiding out for years in Lodibar. Instead, he was hiding from his blessing that the king wanted him to have. How many, by a lack of knowledge and a lack of relationship, how many times in our lives do we miss the power of restoration because of whatever reason we hide from the relationships God has called us in and we hide from the places because of fear of rejection or uh, fear of being considered less than what uh, you believe you're supposed to be or by listening. Can you imagine what Mephibosheth must have listened to? Whatever you do, if David ever finds out about you, he's going to kill you because that's what kings do. And that started from the time he was an infant. And now he's a grown man. And he's still hiding out. I don't even have time to talk about don't hide in the horrors or in the lies of your childhood. Amen. Can I get a better amen? amen? Listen, put them where they go in Jesus' name. Kick them off of your life and say you're a new creation in Christ. Amen. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. God's the God of restoration. When he saves you, if you allow him to, he heals you, spirit, soul, and body. Uh, love is a powerful anointing. Hope is a powerful anointing. Faith is a powerful anointing. Listen, look me right in the face. Righteousness yeah. is a powerful anointing to set you free from all of the insecurities and all the failures of the past. If you realize that you've been made acceptable in the beloved and he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, if in him you live and move and have your being, then let something bad happen, uh, undeserved in your life. And instead of holding on to it, you're like, it just bounces off of me like Teflon. I'm not about to take it. In the name of Jesus, I'm more than a conqueror through that. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If it won't hold up in the presence of the Lord, it's not gonna stick to me. Come on, you got to get it in your inner man. God will restore your inheritance when you understand that not everything you heard that may be sincerely told to you is not necessarily true. Somebody might have told you when you were young that, now that we're poor and we hardworking people and all we ever do is just we try to, we're going to try to make it out of high school and then we're going to just try to grind it out for life. And that's the way it's going to be. So I'm going to raise you rough. So when you get older, you're just going to be tough enough to handle all the bad stuff. Time out. Not good. You're the child of a king. Amen. Technically, the person that was saying that to you should have been the child of a king also. 
But regardless of how yesterday was, now uh, is the time. Now's the day to receive and accept what God has and allow him to kick that off of you and let the power of restoration come into your life. God will restore your inheritance in Christ. And I tell you, if you put your hand to that understanding, even if you've lost natural inheritance, God knows how to get that back to you more than enough. He's the God of restoration. Number three, I've got to hurry now. My time's almost up. Number three, Luke 15, uh, chapter 22, all the way down through 32. Uh, there was a, a product, we call him the prodigal son. And he, he bails out on, on, on his blessing. Because he decides and he kind of does this false spirituality thing where he says, I want my inheritance and I'm going to be fine with it, I promise you. And I'm sure he told the father something like, God told me to take my inheritance now. I'm just sure it is. I'm just supposed to cut away from the father's house and go do my own thing. Uh, but his motive obviously was not pure. It wasn't right. But oftentimes people will mask their motive with some uh, spiritual uh, uh, justification. But if it's contrary to the way of God and to the works of God, then obviously they're lying. Amen. The first person they're lying to is their self because they think everybody else is dumb enough to believe what they're saying. Yeah. But people are smart. Look at two people and he said, and just, just say he, he believes that. Come on, just say it. Yeah, look at the other person and say, everybody's smart, come on. Except you. No, don't say that. I just want to know if you were listening. But the prodigal came to himself and he rose up and he said, I will go back to my father's house. It's important to hear this. And the father did not reject him, but he had been watching for him a long way off. He had scouts way out there looking for him. And when he decides to come back in and he wants to come back home, the father uh, received him and restored him not only did he just uh, let him come back in the house? But now this is so important. Oh, God, help somebody hear this. God restored his relationship. Amen. When God begins to restore, he'll restore relationships. Yes. Look, so many times we don't have relationships with our brothers or our sisters or with our friends or, or with someone that we are actually called, uh, especially families. Especially, if, listen, your family in your problem, it's your purpose. You need to get every person in your family born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. Are y'all listening to me? Uh, it's very important that every person in your family gets saved. That's got to be a desire. It needs to be a screaming desire in your inner man that no one in your DNA is going to go to hell. Glory to God. The same Jesus that set you free will set them free too. It may take a little time, but God loves them as much as he loves you. I don't care how big of a fight, et cetera, that you had at the family reunion. I don't care how much turkey and stuffing that you have thrown at Thanksgiving. God still loves them. Uh, if nothing else, pray someone else across their path. Just begin to pray that God will send someone laborers that they will listen to. And then when you have an opportunity, you share the goodness of God in your life. Instead of telling them what they're doing wrong, tell them what's going right in you in Christ. Uh, because there's a DNA connection more than you realize. And if you understand that you're not just related because you kind of look like that person, you have, a, you have an element of soul uh, in you that is very much like that other person. I don't care how much they're trying to not be like you. It's just there. It's in them because they're part of your blood. Amen. Believe God that every one of them will be saved. Amen. Come on, give somebody a high five right now. Just say, we're going to get them saved. Glory to God. Very important. To do that, sometimes you've got to be vulnerable a little bit to, to, to other people, especially in family. You've got, you, you just got to put that love out there and be willing to accept the fact that they may not receive that. They might even reject it the first time. Second time, the 15th year, the 20th year. But in the name of Jesus, come on. Yeah, the short time that we have to labor in the harvest is nothing compared to eternity. Amen. So don't grow weary in well-doing, but keep pressing and pressing. Someone shout restoration. restoration. Here's the fourth thing, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Uh, and I love this particular verse. God will restore 
the face of Jesus shining through you. Woohoo! How many of you are glad we're Christians because it's a great way to live? <clears throat> Come on, how many of you think it's a great way to live being a Christian? Look, you had to give up a lot of stuff. I mean, you had to give up losing and you had to give up pain and you had to give up all of the fears and you had to give up doubt. You had to give up uh, poverty and all of that because when you're serving God, you just start coming out of that. Amen. Uh, and the face of Jesus, the love of God, the goodness of God, the joy of the Lord, we ought to practice that. I don't know why I keep blending this back or in this, but it, it's in my spirit real strong. Practice it at the house. How many of you are glad you know you're on the way to heaven? I mean, come on, a big smile. Come on, show that one big tooth. Come on, just show it right now. That big smile. Yeah, that joy. Let the goodness of God come through you. God will restore his own face in you. I, I don't believe Jesus was a mean old preacher uh, just beating people up and all of that. You know, he preached some pretty strong stuff, of course, uh, but it, look who he was preaching that stuff to. But no, exactly the opposite. Uh, even, they, even the children, when he would come around, would want to go and get around him. And the disciples were always trying to keep them off of him. And, and Jesus said, no, allow the children to come, for such is the kingdom of God. Uh, and, 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 and my experience is, having been around children all of my life, uh, they're not attracted to people that act mean. Children aren't attracted to somebody uh, who doesn't have a smile and a countenance of joy about their life. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I like those smiles right now. You guys are looking pretty good tonight. It's very important that God will restore the face of Jesus in you. I'm going to tell you this real quick story, and uh, I'll take just a minute out of the time I have left to do this. It's very important to hear this. Years ago, this is many years ago, probably close to 30 years ago, uh, there, there was people that were members of the church. Church wasn't very old in those days. We just kind of built a new building out here. Uh, and so uh, we had some people that, uh, that worked at a travel agency uh, here locally in the area. So uh, I was going to Ireland, I think's where it was. So I used them, of course, to buy, uh, to buy the tickets through because they were members of the church. And, and I trusted that they would take care of the arrangements good. So anyway, I go down to the office of the travel agency. When I go in the travel agency, that person is in there who's a member of the church, so I talked to him just for a moment, and they said, oh, we want to introduce you. I want to introduce you to my boss. I said, oh, great, yeah, I'd love to do that. So it was this lady, a nice, attractive business lady was there, and so when she uh, uh, walked out, uh, this person said, hi, uh, this is Walter Hallam. I'd like to introduce you uh, to him, and she said, oh, hi, how are you doing? And I could feel the vibes instantly. I mean, she's like tele telegraphing, you know, real quick. And... Uh, and the, this other lady says, um, this is my pastor, Pastor Walter Hallam, like that. And she went, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know what she had to be sorry about. Are you listening to me? You have a countenance of godliness about your life. And you just have to let that shine through. Just let it come through. Now, I'm not saying that person was a bad person. They weren't uh, whatsoever, but exactly the opposite. Probably today they're probably saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. But here's what I'm going to say. It's important that you let the face of Jesus just shine through you. Just let, let that face shine through you. Come on, look at someone and say, I'm so sorry about your hair. Come on, tell them that right now. I'm just so sorry. Number five, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 talks about it. Jesus looked out, listen, and he had compassion. He had compassion, and he saw people as sheep without shepherd. He saw unsaved people not as bad people. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send people there. People are not our problem. Come on, we said it a moment ago. They're our purpose. Uh, how do you see people? Well, I tell you, this world's got so much bad stuff and there's so much bad going on and those young people are so bad and everything's so bad and everything's bad. No, it's not. No, it's shepherdless sheep. Because Jesus died for them just like he died for you and me. At some point, 
if we can reach them, we won't have to, especially if we can reach them when they're young for Jesus, you don't have to rescue them from somewhere Amen. later on. But it doesn't make any difference whether it's in the prison, on the deathbed, on the job, or just someone that you meet. They are actually someone that Jesus has died for. Uh, they are sheep without a shepherd. And they have to receive him as the shepherd of their soul. Uh, Psalms 23, as the Lord of their soul. The Lord is my shepherd. Are y'all doing okay? And so uh, God will restore, listen, your passion for getting other people saved. Remember when you first were born again, you just couldn't shut up about it. I mean, Jeremiah, it was like fire inside of your bones. You just wanted to share the gospel. You wanted to pray. Uh, look, there was no safe sick person around you. They got around you. Before you go, you're going to pray for them. There was just something about you. You had that passion. That comes from compassion. Understanding that there are many people that just need the touch of the shepherd. They need the oil of the great shepherd pouring upon their head, the Bible says. And that happens through you and me. And when God begins to restore to you the years, God's not just restoring 365 days. He's restoring anointings in you and glorious things inside of you that are used for His glory. Amen. Come on up here and help me if you would, please. It's important to get this. Uh, Psalms 23, 6, this is number 6. Psalms 23, 6, this is so good. God will restore your brain. He will restore your mind. Come on, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Today, one of the uh, members in absentee of the church, uh, who they, they, uh, he's 94 years old. I had a, a wonderful little meeting with him today. He's 94. Just as clear talking just as you and me right now. He's, he's uh, uh, frail in his body some, but uh, thank God he drove here. And, and had his uh, beautiful little wife with him. She's getting on up in age also. And we talked, and she was talking good, but she says, I'm having these losses of memory in uh, certain years and certain times. There's, a, there's about a 20-year span of time. She said, I just cannot remember anything from those, those years back there, about a 20-year span of time. And so we're talking, we're talking like that, and she was fine to talk about that, but she said, I'm having these problems. I'm suddenly dropping out my memory like now. And you know, the Bible says that God will, in Psalms 23, verse 6, He will restore my soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. He says, He restoreth my soul. Come on, lay your hands on your head right now. And for just 10 seconds, pray over yourself. Father, in Jesus' name, come on, pray over yourself. Lord, let, let your anointing be on the head, the mind of every man and woman here. Thank you, Lord. No dementia. Thank you, Heavenly Father. No, no, no Alzheimer's. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for supernatural quickness in our memory, our recall, and in our vision to see ahead. You said that you would restore. You'd restore years. Thank you, God, for that supernatural ability because you restore our soul. Glory to God. Help us, Lord, to reproduce in others a restored soul. The last thing, number seven, Jeremiah 30. It's one of the great scriptures of the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17. God will restore your health. God restores health. I'll restore health unto you, and I will heal you, the Bible says, of all your hurts, your wounds, saith the Lord, because you have called, you've been called an outcast saying, this is Zion who no man seeketh after. Listen, God never abandons you and he will restore your health. He will heal your wounds. So many times in life, we pick up a lot of wounds along the way and not only a physical, but emotionally and spiritually. And they just seem to always be there. And every now and then the scab gets pulled off of that. And there you're dealing with it again. Do I have good news? 
How many of you know that even if the world calls you an outcast, if you're a citizen of God, a citizen of Zion, uh, one of God's elect, the Bible calls you, called and elect, he heals your wounds and restores your health. Amen. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. To learn more, visit walterhallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.